As we can see from this map of 1817, Ronvo is part of one of the principal valleys running from the north to the south of the island. The stream that runs through the valley has shaped the history and the people of Cronvo. From the 11th to the 19th centuries, working water mills were located on the banks of the 12 main streams in Jersey, with at least 38 separate mills in existence. A few of the mills were called back into service during the occupation period. The mills were essential to the local community, who would rely on them to grind their corn to make bread. They were also significant sources of revenue. Each mill would have belonged to a local fife owner, the monarch, or the church. The tenants living on the fife would be obliged to grind their corn at the mill and to also render service, being either labour or materials, for the upkeep of the mill and the buildings. The Doomsday Book of 1086 lists over 6,000 mills in England. Looking at the Godfrey map of 1849, we can see three major water mills located near what is now Granville Reservoir Stevens or Malassises Mill, Granval or Granvaux Mill, and Paul or Louis Poole Mill. This is an image of the Moulin de Malassis, dated 1895. Called Stevens Mill on the Godfrey map, it was burned to the ground in 1961 and the site cleared for housing in 1989. There was a mill on the site for at least 700 years, as the mill is mentioned in the extent of 1274, showing the king's income for the island. At this time, the crown received 28 leave for two mills in the parish of St. Saviour. The mill is also mentioned in the extent of 1331. The earliest document we hold that specifically relates to the mill comes from the La Cloche collection. Records from the 15th century show that the La Cloche family first leased the mill from the procurer of the king. In 1487, Estienne La Cloche leases the mill and agrees to repair and maintain it, whilst also paying any rents due to the sovereign. The leases are renewed by subsequent monarchs in the 16th century, with Stephen La Cloche paying 12 courtiers of wheat and 4 capons of rent to the Queen each year in 1562. This document is from 1484. It is the earliest lease of the mill that we have. It records that Guil Harabi, a signer of Grondin and of Fief de Grainville, has an old mill called the Moulin de Malassis in St. Saviour, on which he owes the king four chapons and in his estate of disrepair. He gives all rights to the mill to Lawyer Jean, procurer of the king. Records show the lease in perpetuity from Lawyer Jean, procurer of the sovereign, to Estienne La Cloche of the Moulin de Malassis St. Saviour for the sum of 15 courtiers of wheat and four chapons of rent in 1484. In 1601, Elizabeth I granted the mill to Stephen and it remained in the possession of the La Cloche family for the next two centuries. Malassis Mill was inherited by Reverend John La Cloche in 1775 from Matthew Jean La Cloche, his father. Jean was a rector of Trinity for 45 years until his death in 1811. His obituary in the Gazette describes him as a dignified and respected rector with a sweet nature and patience. He was also charitable and zealous in his worship of God. By the mid-1830s, Thomas Stevens, a miller from Hampshire, England, had purchased the mill from Philippe Lemaitre. By looking at the records of fire insurance in the island, we can assume that he was a tenant of the property prior to this date. In May 1837, Thomas Stevens of St. Helier, a miller, is insuring Malassis Mill and its stock in trade for £1,000 sterling. This extract relates to the corn stored by Thomas and his brother James in a store on the pier. We can assume that this is why it was known as Stevens Mill on the 1849 Godfrey map. Thomas is 48 in the 1851 census, and he has Jersey connections. His grandmother-in-law is listed as Sophia Galashaw and was born in Jersey. Thomas obviously owned the mill through the 1850s and 1860s, but he did not live at the property. In 1861, he is listed as living in St. Helier with his wife Sophia and ten children, aged from 19 to 2. Thomas sold the mill to Elie Labat in 1866, and the Labat family owned the mill to 1905. Again, the family did not live in the property. In 1891, Samuel Gilly, a 44-year-old miller from Devon, is listed as living in the mill with his wife Mary and eight children. By 1901, Samuel is listed as the miller at Tesson Mill in St. Peter, and his son is still listed at living at Tesson Mill during the occupation. The mill was bought and sold several times in the first half of the 20th century, until it was purchased from the public by the Jersey New Waterworks Company in 1989 and turned into housing. Malassis Mill, which was operated by the Department of Agriculture during the occupation, was requisitioned in February 1945. This document shows the equipment that was requisitioned at Malassis. Two fire buckets, three foam extinguishers, 
three bundles of twine and driving belts for the machinery. At the same time, Malassis was requisitioned, so was the Grand Vaux mill. Another reminder of the occupation in Grand Vaux are the tunnels. This is the large tunnel complex which was drawn up in 1962 and taken from the War Office survey. It is located to the northwest of Poor Mill at the upper end of the valley, and by May 1944 ammunition had been moved from Fort Regent to this spot. After the war this tunnel was used by the Jersey Potato Cannons Limited and was taken over by Jersey New Waterworks to store pipes and other equipment. In 2003 work was undertaken to open up one of the sealed galleries. Unfortunately two men were overcome by exhaust fumes and the tunnels have been empty and locked since this date. This is an image of the entrance to the tunnel complex. There was another tunnel entrance in the Grombo area to the ration store situated to the north of the main valley between Mount Neron and La Roussieu. This entrance lies in the form of Bichard's quarry, which was filled in in the 1960s. Grand Vaux, or Granville Mill, was in fact the principal mill in the area, and was known as the King's Great Mill in the medieval records. The 1607 extent, which lists rents and services due to the Crown, describes the obligations that tenants had. All the King's Majesties, tenants of this parish, which have any harvest of corn in the parish, owe sweet to the King's Great Mill of Grand Vaux within the parish of St. Saviour to grind all their corn at the said mill, and which they have no harvest there, and have land within the parish, should come to the mill at least three times a year with two bushels of corn, all saints, Christmas and Easter. Every default should be paid by a quarter of a cabra of corn, and they that fail which have harvest there ought to be punished by the discretion of justice. This mill was also in the hands of the Lacloche family until 1776, when it was sold to Charles William Leggett. By 1813, the mill had been sold to Philippe de Cartret, and he was responsible for building a new mill in the place of the old building, which he then sold to Nicholas Lecane in 1919. In 1876, James Baxter purchased the mill from Clement Augusta Ketterville, and the mill remained in the Baxter family until it was sold to Jersey New Waterworks Company in 1947. Again, James was a miller who came to Jersey from Hampshire. He left the mill to his son William. William's son Alfred then sold the mill to Jersey New Waterworks in 1947. The last of the three mills that I'm going to talk about is the Moulin de Louis Pool Mill, or Pool Mill as it is known on the 1849 Godfrey map. This mill house is still standing today. Pool Mill has links with both the Lacloche family and the Gilly families who we have already mentioned. In the 1749 extent, listing the revenues due to the king, John Lacloche is paying four cabos of six pound per year on the Moulin de Louis Pool. In 1889, the mill was purchased by Samuel Gilly, who we know was working at Malassis Mill. The property eventually ended up in the hands of Samuel's brother Edward and was sold in 1925. Just up Mount Neron, we can still see the property Stirling Castle and Stirling Castle Farm. Stirling Castle Farm is the older property, with a lintel dating back to 1647 and a date stone inscribed CPL SCL 1766. The initials on this stone stand for Charles Lomprier and Suzanne Collas, the parents of John Lomprier, author of Lomprier's Classical Dictionary. Inside the house there is apparently a lintel dated 1647, with the initials MD and E, thought to stand for Matthew Dory and Elizabeth Rossier, who was widow of Jacques Pibon when she married Matthew. Elizabeth's daughter from her first marriage, Marie, was the centre of an island scandal in 1649, when, on the 8th of August, she married Thomas Pointchester. Marie was aged around 11 at the time, and Thomas was 36. Marie's tutor, Helia Dumaresque, objected to the marriage. This entry from the royal court is dated the 9th of August. It gives details of the marriage, and Helia asks for Thomas to be seized by the constable of St. Saviour and presented before justice. The constable was unable to find Thomas Marie. The court ordered that Marie should be returned to her tutor, Helia Dumaresque, and Thomas should be brought to court to answer for his crime. Jean Messevy, Matthew Dory, Mary's stepfather, and Philippe Alban were all sent to the castles as accomplices to the crime. Stirling Castle Farm received its current name from association with the building opposite, which was built by Edward Stirling. Edward also owned the farm, purchasing the house from George de la Parelle in 1846. This is Stirling Castle. The castle was built on the land in the Jardin de Bat in La Valette, purchased by Edward Stirling, a retired servant of the East India Company, from James Boreham in May 1847. Edward was born in 1797, the eighth son of Andrew Sterling. The family lived just outside Glasgow. He first went to India in 1817, 
During his time abroad, he travelled through Persia, Afghanistan, and India. Edward resigned from service in the 1840s, and first purchased property in St. Helena in 1846. It was not uncommon for retired military and civil servants to move to the island. The foundation stone for Stirling Castle was laid in 1850, and this was to become an important year in Edward's life. Edward was a 53-year-old bachelor when he moved to Jersey. His final years in the civil service had been blighted by ill health and failing sight. It must have come as a surprise to his family and friends when on the 23rd of September 1850 he married Anna Isabella Glasscock, who was only 23, 30 years younger than Edward. Unfortunately, the marriage did not start well. Apparently three weeks after the wedding, Anna told her husband that she was returning to London. She returned 15 days later with her mother, who appeared to patch up any quarrel between the couple, and sent them on their honeymoon to St. Malo on the 15th of November. The Chronique de Jersey records that Edward soon discovered that on the ship to St. Malo was one of his wife's acquaintances, Captain Benjamin Page, who she had met at Ball in Dublin. On arrival to St. Malo, the Stirlings booked into the Hotel de France, with Page taking the room next door to their suite. Page apparently dined with the couple, who took advantage of Edward's blindness, acting in an indecent manner in public. Mrs. Sterling left their suite for the next three quarters of an hour that evening, and was later seen leaving Page's room by a servant at the hotel. Edward left for St. Helier the next day, and Page and Mrs. Sterling went to Paris and on to London. Edward applied to the ecclesiastical courts for divorce through annulment, but as there was no legal civil divorce in Jersey, this was a lengthy process, with no real chance of success. The court register records that Edward and Anna ceased to live together as a man and wife after the 16th of November. It proceeds to tell the story in detail. Anna returned to Jersey on the 17th of January 1851 and stayed at the York Hotel for two nights. She then stayed at 22 Belmont Road until the 13th of January. Apparently a John Dyer entered their apartment and they spent time together at an advance hour of the night. The register records that Sterling alleges that the crime of adultery took place. Anna is accused of committing adultery with three other men who visited her rooms late at night during the six-day period. Edward used this evidence to apply for divorce, Thora et Menza. This is basically a separation granted by a court, whereby a husband and wife are not required to live together, but their marriage has not been legally dissolved. Neither spouse has the right to remarry. The divorce case was sent on for several years, with Anna claiming rights to demand maintenance from Edward. This case became notorious in Jersey society. Eventually, the court decided that Edward was required to pay maintenance for £100 a year, but the case was still not decided. Eventually, Anna died in 1859, and Edward was free of a very costly matrimonial mistake. Edward continued to live at Stirling Castle until his death in December 1873. In the 1871 census, he is registered as blind and is living with Sophia Morris, his secretary and manager, Pauline King, the cook, and 19-year-old Anne Ryan as the housemaid. Edward died in 1873, and in his testament he leaves all his household furniture and effects to Barbe Metz, also known as Miss Mars. The testament contains a comprehensive list of furniture and household goods, including a piano, seven mahogany chairs, flower stand, and pepper box. It also lists 128 books left to Miss Metz, which include Coleridge's poetical works and a narrative of the Arctic land expedition. Edward left his immovable estate, including Stirling Castle, to his nephew Charles, having already given Miss Metz Clarendon House in Clarendon Road and two Tudor Place in Midvale Road in 1863. A last word on Edward Stirling. Just before reaching Stirling Castle, you can see the drinking fountain. Inscriptions on capping stone include 1868, E. Stirling Fessit. The words at the base read, On nature's stores rely, your wants they will supply, kingdoms their wealth unfold, by labour, wit, and gold. Further to the south of Stirling Castle is another house that stands out prominently on the 1849 Godfrey map, Elise, now the location of Elise Estate. Frederick Dumaresque started purchasing land in the area, Petit and Grand Clos de Briard, in 1828. House came to Mary Dumaresque, mother of Sir John Lacouta, in 1845 from Frederick Dumaresque, son of her brother, Captain Philip Dumaresque. Frederick died without issue, but acquired Elise and left it to his aunt. Mary died in April 1845, and the property passed to her son, Sir John Lacouta. Sir John lived at Bellevue in St. Brellard, and therefore rented out Elise through the 1850s and 1860s. Elise has an interesting link with Admiral Sir George Sartorius, who was interested in renting the property in 1855. The house was inherited by Reverend Henry John Lacouta Sumner 
from his father, Sir John Lacuta, on the 24th of September, 1879, and then sold to Mrs. Furnival for eleven courtiers, four cabots of wheat rent, and one thousand four hundred and four pounds ten shilling on the 10th of November, 1879. The house was sold for housing after the Second World War. On a line to the east on the Godfrey map is another house, Laveau. Only gates remain of what would appear to have been a grand residence. Another house, built presumably in the late 1820s after the Cotille, on which it was located, was sold by Gideon Achia to Francois Perrault in 1828. By the 1840s, the property was owned by the Labelli family, who sold the house in 1899. In 1919, Laveau was purchased by Sir George McCartney, who lived in the property with his wife, Lady Catherine. Sir George was another military man who had retired to Jersey after serving at the British Consul General in Kashgar in China. McCartney was half Chinese. His father, Halliday McCartney, was a member of the same family as George McCartney, the 18th century British ambassador to China, and his mother was a near relative of La Wang, one of the leaders of the Taiping Rebellion. This is a picture of Sir George's registration card. He died on the 19th of May, just ten days after the end of the occupation. The property was eventually sold to a development company in the 1970s. But what of Grand Vaux today? As we have already seen, in 1947, Jersey New Waterworks purchased land and buildings in the area. The reservoir was built between 1948 and 1953 and still remains in use today. The increased number of housing estates led to the development of Grand Vaux School in 1968, which was recently redeveloped.